Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast, Pip Wilson. Great to see you. Thank you for having me, Dan. How are you? It's a real pleasure to have you here because Pip has uh, uh, an incredible CV. And I'm going to embarrass you now by reading it out on, on the podcast. And this is a, uh, it's really very illustrious. She is not only a one-time entrepreneur, she's a multiple-time entrepreneur, what we call a serial tech entrepreneur but since 2002, which to my reckoning means you've been 19 years in the game, which is a, a, a real, uh, I mean, listen, to be, to be at it for that long is a real achievement. Uh, she built a company called Bluefin Solutions, an IT consultancy, and exited that business in 2015. And she's now co-founder and CEO of Amicable, which helps couples get an amicable divorce with less cost. Uh, and we're going to get into that in a bit because it's a really fantastic and interesting business. She's also an investor, a startup mentor. She's passionate about empowering women in tech and is therefore a trustee of an organization called The Girls Network. She's also a trustee of the RSA and I believe has been deputy chair since October 2019. She blogs on angel investment and women in tech on various high profile blogs. And if that wasn't enough, her and her business partner, Kate, were featured in the Maserati Top 100 Entrepreneurs of 2018. And I can only assume they gave you a free Maserati as a result. Is that true? Yes, I <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll, let's put it forward as an idea to the Maserati people. But uh, yeah, so in a very illustrious career and a long-standing career, and I'm, I'm really, uh, so thank you for coming on the podcast. And, and actually, I'm just going to kick off and go right back 19 years ago, zooming back in time, because you had a career as a consultant prior to becoming an entrepreneur, working with big companies, perhaps working at big companies. I'm, I was just intrigued. What led you to leave this sort of, I guess, relatively safe environment as a consultant with big companies to go into this shark infested waters of entrepreneurship? Well, I think it's interesting, Dan, because at the time, it felt like a very easy decision. Um, I was in my, my mid twenties and I actually left as part of um, a group. There was four of us who co-founded Bluefin together. And we'd spent a while having meetings on the fact that we felt there was a real opportunity to do a kind of subsection of what we've been doing for a bigger company and do it ourselves and do it in a slightly different way. It was, it was a relatively new part of technology. It was the business intelligence side of what we were, were doing. And it, it was exciting to me, the opportunity to do something different. And if it didn't work, I figured that I could go back to what I had been doing. So actually, why not give it a shot? Um, and it was a good group that, that were kind of planning on starting this together. So that part, it felt like a very easy decision. And you, you focus on what's going to happen for the next year, what's not, not what's going to happen for the next uh, 10 to 15 years. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Now, it's funny because my um, entrepreneurial journey started in 2001 and, and mine was quite similar I think I was, I was a, I'm a few years older than you but I was sort of 27 ish and thought yeah why not give it a go and and I can always go and get another job kind of thing so, so yeah so you you sort of went into this entrepreneurial world and what happened what happened then so we um I think we had the right mixture we had a uh, the right makings of a business that could be successful and actually was relatively successful quite quickly in that we grew and started employing people and landed some customers and navigated that first kind of few years relatively successfully. Um, there was definitely pain points uh, along the way and we hit various uh, economic crises and <laughs> um, uh, the kind of world events that sort of mean that you write a business plan and then you turn around and say, oh, that's, we're not going to come anywhere close to that. What are we going to do? And how, what decisions do we have to make? And we had a couple of times where we had to lose groups of people because it was either um, the market we were in wasn't quite right at that point or we'd grown too quickly and then things had had changed. So there was definitely some difficult times, but on the whole, looking back, it was 13 very exciting years of kind of growth and taking the business from 
zero to getting on for 300 people and in four countries. Wow. That's an, that's an, that's an amazing, amazing achievement, actually, because it's, it's to, to, to sort of to do that and to pull that off. So going back, like you said, there's always these various things that were kind of challenging. And the the life of being an entrepreneur, whilst with, you know, it's, when things go well, you look back at it with rose-tinted glasses, perhaps, but you intimated there there were some challenging times. What do you think was the, the, the sort of first time where you really felt, oops, this is really serious? I think, so I, I remember the first, so my role for a lot of our growth was CRO. So I did... Oh, I ran finance, HR, um, all the internal functions. Um, and um, we, uh, I remember the first time I wrote the business plan when we were probably 50 people, et cetera. And I wrote this business, uh, it, I, I wrote the kind of more complex plan that we've been using to date. And we had the whole first year and I pretty much, we hit the plan. And it got to the end of the year and it's like, I'm good at this. I am a natural. <laughs> I can write a brilliant business plan. And then we revised it for the next year and had an appalling year and felt completely short of everything that we'd aimed at, largely due to kind of external factors. Right. (laughs) That maybe I wasn't a natural at (laughs) writing business plans. It wasn't necessarily quite that easy. You write it and then it happens. Um, But that, that time of going, okay, hold on a minute, we've been quite ambitious and aggressive in our growth and we're not going to make those numbers and actually we've got too many people for the amount of work we've come in and we have to to therefore make some difficult people decisions the first time we had to do that that was very tough mm-hmm. um and i think we only did it tw- i only had to do that twice in in 13 years so it it, it certainly wasn't the theme of, of where things went but when you are looking at cash flow and looking at things and going, yeah, this 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 might not work. We're going to have to do something serious to look after the whole business. That becomes a real kind of eye opener. And was that relatively early on that first sort of moment? No, no, no. It was probably kind of two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine, when okay. the, yeah, oh the economic yeah, got it. So so you kind of so two thousand two through two thousand eight, you're kind of cooking on gas, and then. Yeah. And then you've got you've solved business planning, and everything's cool. <laughs> and then you get this like you hit a brick wall of 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 of, of some description. So so at that moment when you sort of realised that your plan and reality were somewhat out of kilter, how did that make you feel? I think I, I think with anything like that, you have a, a period of realisation of mm, this is not what I want to happen, but ultimately this is the reality. And you have to move from the uh, don't don't want to deal with this to I have to deal with this as quickly as possible because that's part of leadership. Um, and then break things up into well, what decisions need to be made and how are we going to make those decisions? And once you've got that kind of acceptance that we're going to do it, then it, it's a case of doing what needs to be done. So you sound like you've got this very kind of methodical view of crises as they were coming up there's a there's a there's a uh, you had a plan reality didn't agree and then you started to 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 face this with a kind of a a series of almost quite simple decisions to kind of slice uh your thinking into a ways you can you can work with it so so what do you learn from that first experience that ultimately you can go through difficult things but you can come out the other side and move on. And actually, and it comes back to me, I think something that's always been very clear to me and that a big part of, of kind of whether it's entrepreneurship or leadership, et cetera, is about making decisions. And often there's a real paralysis for people around making decisions about stuff. Um, and someone has to in order to move forwards. And you can't overthink things and spend too long going is this the right decision? You just, you ultimately have to get as much information as you can, look at the information you've got and then make a decision and, and trust your decision. And uh, yeah, it might not always be right, um, but moving forwards is almost always the best course of action. Uh, and actually doing something rather than being passive 
it is almost the best course uh, is almost always the best course of action so it, it is about that decision making yeah because it's interesting like with um what's happened in the last year with the pandemic again it's another set of circumstances that have imposed themselves on everybody mm-hmm. similarly to what happened in 2008-9 and just on that subject of decision making it's quite it's an interesting one because from the experiences you've had uh, focus around this idea of decision making in times of difficulty okay what do you what do you would do you have you learned over that time that you think would be applicable for someone now perhaps struggling with with making choices or making decisions um i that it is about not being afraid to make a decision because often i've seen people get into far worse situations by going round and round in circles because of fear of making the wrong decision. Uh, when it came to the pandemic, I mean, uh, we were all forced to just get on with it. Um, and we knew as a company that um, we had to get everybody at home. And so we had to make decisions on how we were going to do that, what software everyone was going to use, how uh, what, what rules we were going to set in order to enable the company to start working. Um, and actually that being forced can be quite helpful. <laughs> Mm. But there was no choice. And I, I think sometimes in, in other less obvious situations, you have to look at it and go, okay, well, we could do either of these things, but we really need to do one of them. So let's look at them both and take our best guess as to which is the, the right way to go and then move forwards with it. So can you give me an example of, of, of that kind of way of thinking that, that you you had sort of perhaps when you were at Bluefin? Uh, so we were wanted to start an overseas support office and we we knew we needed it. We had to be able to support some of our customers on a 24-7 basis. So you've got to you've got to find somewhere else in the world to be able to set up. <laughs> There's various ways you can do this. You can pay companies a huge amount of money to go and do research in lots of different areas, or you can look at at high level information you can find in terms of can we find candidates? What's the time zone? What's the and I remember us going, right, are we going to get an external company to do this or are we just going to make a decision on it? And in the end we did a piece of internal research that said, right, let's look at these five factors, weigh them up, have a meeting and decide. And we did and and ended up setting up in Kuala Lumpur, which actually turned out uh, to be a very good decision because it gave us an access to the local Asian market. It became a kind of really key place for us. Mm. Uh, it was one of those things we could have spent a long time doing it, but actually business reality. And I think as an entrepreneur, you're always cost conscious. Mm. It's how can I get best decision without occurring fast costs that might be better used on something else. Yeah, very fair. Yeah, that's interesting. And then that sort of bootstrap spirit, perhaps, of of trying to make sure you're doing something very cost effectively because you're using a precious resource, i.e. your money. Yes. And and, and, do you, and so you, when you're in that decision making mode, how do you, you do you, how do you make it how do you make a choice between something that's you can run like that or something that perhaps does need more reflection? How, how would you approach that? I'm not sure there's a magic formula to that. I mean, it's a really interesting question. And I guess as experience go, as you grow with experience, you're more likely to, to feel comfortable to trust your own instinct, mm-hmm. um, to go, okay, I, I know this is the kind of thing where actually external help can really add value. Um, whereas there's other things where you're like, well, okay. And sometimes you have to get an external proposal to look at it and go, you're going to charge us this much to do this? Actually, I think we could do this ourselves. Mm. <laughs> so when you actually break down what somebody is is looking to do and what expertise they're bringing, it can be very, it can be much more obvious where um, the value is being at, uh, the value is being added. Yeah, it's interesting. Carl Castledine, who I interviewed recently, he he's, uh, runs a, a holiday park business. But he said a similar thing. He, he had a company looking at user experience in his parks, and it was going to cost a load of money and let's take a lot of time. But he just said, well, I'll do it myself. I'll walk around and be the shopper 
and it, and it was far better for him because he was actually out there on the shop floor learning rather than hiring a, an expensive consultancy to do it. And I think it's something interesting there about the entrepreneur and the, uh, the willingness to kind of muck in or get do it. And, and, and do you think, so do you feel as a sort of an emotional response there that you as an entrepreneur felt at that time or subsequently, just when you see these situations or you're given proposals, you think, nah, nah I'm going to do this myself. Or I'm going to drive this forward myself. I think there's especially an emotional response when you feel like you've wasted money. I think the first time we used an external company to do an R&D claim for <laughs> and not only did they effectively ask us so many questions that we wrote it ourselves, we then had to rewrite it when they'd done it and then they got the numbers wrong and then they wanted 30% of our claim. <laughs> <laughs> right. And then very clearly the following... Um, uh, yeah, my uh, head of finance and I said, we, uh, we're, we're just going to do this ourselves. <laughs> There's no possible way. And, and actually, I think it's uh, you, you learn from those kind of things where you think, mm. no, this this hurts that I have spent that money <laughs> rather than um, uh, I'm looking at something and thinking, mm, not sure whether that's going to add the value. That's interesting. It's the emotional response. Yeah. Like anger, pissed offness annoyance these are signposts and it's, 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 it's a, a, a lot another thing that's come up in a number of my um, uh, interviews on the podcast is this i kind of the intuition and just following your, your gut instinct and, and did you feel that's that's been a, a part of your decision making over over the over the years yeah absolutely and i think it is a massive part but you have to be careful not to make decisions purely on instinct and mm. it's that balance of asking the right questions of the team to, to just so what we try and do is when we know we have to make a decision is to make sure, I mean, we have right from the start of Amicable and obviously all the way through Bluefin have had a monthly management meeting, have had a kind of that business structure of a way of running the business that means that the decisions are hopefully made efficiently with the right people involved, but are, um, but have some structure to them. So mm. whoever is kind whoever area it's responsible for will bring that um the information in a, in an easily accessible format to say, right, these are the options, which one of these oh, these are the pros and cons, let me make a decision. And this is the decision I'm recommending. And normally the decision by that point becomes really obvious. Um and you know, so you're not thinking, well, this is purely based on instinct. But often the instinct could be able to drive like, okay, I think we should go this way, but can we just validate it against X, Y, and Z and make sure, um, but not at a nth degree at a level that gives us that that confidence. So it's almost a, it's a balance of structure and intuition. Yeah, exactly. And what do you think the sweet spot is? I, I, the sweet spot is probably more structure, but not to the point of slowing things down. Okay, so speed is a yeah. consideration in that. Speed is hugely important in any fast-growing or entrepreneurial business. You haven't got the luxury and time, and, and in, right from the start of my career, the brief time I spent at a large company, um, but also when we were doing consulting projects to large companies, the slow decision-making was the thing that I found so frustrating <laughs> mm. and always put me off working within a kind of very large organisation was that to get stuff done, you have to go through multiple levels of sign-off and approval and um, uh, checks, et cetera, that, that really do hamper innovation and hamper the ability for entrepreneurial things to happen. So could you give me an example of, um, say, during the Bluefin time, where that rapidity really helped you, uh, the d rapidity of decision-making and kind of get that rapid innovation really helped you get to where you got to? Yeah, I'm casting my mind back. This has been a while now. Um, but I think our ability to be able to set up new business lines. So we were we were working with SAP when and when we started – of 20-something oh, years, SAP was a one-product company and it then launched um, various uh, other products of which we started with business intelligence. But we could move very quickly if we saw them launching something else that looked exciting 
we could focus on either skilling people up or employing people or getting those skills so that we were continually offering to our customers that we were effectively a leading edge uh, SAP consultancy and that knowing that we had an employee brand that people liked and wanted to join combined with the type of customers who were interested in in the newer bits of the technology meant that we were able to kind of move very quickly and become experts in that, which really helped with our growth. And, and just, did that just keep your commercial edge sharp? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, interesting. So we've got a, we've covered a bit of the, your time. Well, I've been sort of focusing on sort of early time. We've had been talking around about decisions and fear of making decisions. The thing I'm actually interested is um, because your current company is very much about a stressful moment in someone's life, but the life of an, of an entrepreneur is stressful uh, or can be stressful, uh, and. I'm just curious to see how your uh, uh, approach to stressful situations, be it at the, the uh, back in 2008 or subsequently, or perhaps even going through the business sale, h- how do you approach the, the sort of topic of stressful situations yourself? I mean, I think to do the job I've done and still am doing, I probably have a fairly good capacity for stress. <laughs> um, otherwise, I, I wouldn't be able to to do it. And um i know that i can um distance myself as needed and have time out i have a family i have three kids um i have a good kind of group of friends and try and make sure that everything isn't about work and and that's my big stress release in that if i know that time with kids time with friends etc gives me that ability to just distance myself which then allows me to be kind of fully focused and and coping with whatever um startup life might throw at me Mm. on a day-to-day basis and there are there's certainly been times that have been a greater level of stress um whether it's sales not being quite where you want them to be or 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 ultimate within amicable which um uh, was the, the court case that we had, which I'm happy to go into more detail. Yeah, let's, let's go to the court case. That sounds like fun. So, so, so hang on. So, so Bluefin's happened. You're out of Bluefin. You've been dealing with these, learning your sort of entrepreneurial trade, as it were, and you've, you've now started Amicable. Yes. And in fact, can you just describe what Amicable does? Yeah, absolutely. So Amicable helps people um, going through relationship breakdown to do it in a different way than the traditional legal process. So we work with couples who are divorcing, separating, or, or co-parenting in order to get make their arrangements for their family, split their finances, and kind of do all the divorce paperwork. Um, but we don't do it in a legal approach. We do it as a people-first approach with the legal stuff there as needed. Okay, so 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 again, you, the whole subject you're focused on is this again stressful life moment that people are going through. But you launched this this startup, and then I believe you had a very stressful moment with a, a court case. So what, what happened? Um, so we've been going for um, probably uh, we'd we'd been working with customers probably for eighteen months, and to give you kind of a bit of the background. Um, Ample was really founded following my uh, co-founder, Kate Daly's um, very car crash of a divorce, uh, mm-hmm. where she came out the other side and looked at it and said, hold on a minute, how did it go so wrong? How did we end up in court, spend so much money, etc.?" And realized that actually the process had had a big impact. So the way that the legal process was structured and the fact that it's by its nature, adversarial and pits two people against each other had really um, led them down a particular route um, that they, if you'd asked at the start, no one wanted to go down that route. Um, And so she was then uh, retrained as a family consultant and helping other people through it. Um, And we'd been friends for a long time, kind of predating this. And I'd... um, just exited uh, Bluefin and thought, I know, well, I'd quite like to do another startup. Really? <laughs> and, uh, so so when, when did you exit? You, so was it July 2015 you exited Bluefin? Right. Yeah. And so so when did you set up Amicable? Mm, August 2015. Really? 
<laughs> like, uh, for the from a legal perspective, but we actually for the first year we were just playing around with ideas and stuff. So we had the company, but we hadn't really kicked anything off properly. So right. we we properly launched customers in two thousand and seventeen. So about four years ago. Okay, great. I was going to say you're a glutton for punishment, and if you set up like <laughs> the following yeah. month, uh... no, it was it was a very slow look. We think there's something here but we need to really look at it in a bit more detail. Um, and and the kind of premise was that we could combine kind of Kate's psychological approach, et cetera, with technology in order to have something that could scale. And that's what we felt was that was that was really missing. There was nothing else in the market. There still really isn't anything that similar. Um, and there's a real opportunity. Um, so yeah, so we launched customers and it was going well and growing pretty quickly. And we were about to kick off the funding round. And when I say about, I had the pitch deck ready to send out on that morning. And we got a letter saying um, that one of the uh, family court judges had referred uh, one of our cases to the high court, not because they necessarily thought there was anything wrong with it, but they thought the position wasn't clarified as to whether we could work with couples. So they wanted it clarified, and the way judges get things clarified is in the High Court. <laughs> wow. So that was, and that was going to be in December. Now, we were fairly, we were confident where we stood legally because we'd had solicitors, regulatory authority sign off. We'd had a lot of advice when we started. But obviously, this is still a big test case. And uh, and the bigger impact was probably the fact that we were about to kick a funding round off and trying to raise cash with this hanging over your head isn't necessarily no. um, a particularly easy thing. So we had to um, put the funding round on hold. We reached out to our – at that point, we'd done one decent-sized angel round. So we reached out to our – angel investors and explain the situation um, and offered them uh, the chance to invest at kind of a discount on the next round if they do it straight away. And what I mean, what was great is that I think we got, we raised a couple of hundred thousand in about two weeks. So real backing from our, our angel investors. And that gave us enough to get through to, to the court case, um, which we did. Um, and then the judge and the judgment that came through was overwhelmingly positive and actually kind of really has helped us since then and clarified the situation. Um, so kind of in retrospect, we're, we're very glad it happened. But as you can imagine, it was a fairly stressful few months. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a very a fantastic case study of how often the thing that looks horrendous can be the best path. And, and there's, there's a, a book I've referenced a couple of times, actually, called The Obstacle is the Way, which is a book about stoic philosophy. But the title really is, says it. It's like that. that. So, so take me back to the moment you're sat there on a Friday. I think you said it was a Friday. In fact, what, what year was this with the court case happened? Because 2017, you started selling to customers. And... Um, it had been 2019. Got so it, yeah. September, September 2019. Yes, all right. Okay. So, so, to, so you're there with your pitch deck about to sort of launch off into the sort press of send. <laughs> just about press send and this letter arrives. What what happened? What was your emotional response to that? Oh, I think it was probably <laughs> the first thing. I, do, I remember very clearly Kate and I walking. We're in a converted stable block here in our offices, uh, which is where I'm currently sitting. And we kind of walked up and down the alleyway outside a bit and went, hmm. Okay. Although I think quite quickly we we did, and got, I mean, I like the book you referred to, I think is absolutely right. And we had always said that in order to make what we're doing more mainstream, we will probably have to challenge the status quo. So I think we quite quickly recognised that it wasn't all negative. Um, I am generally quite a positive person. There is bright sides in pretty much everything. So sometimes you have to look a bit harder. But I think there was that, okay, well, there is a plus side here. We will get exposure by this that we otherwise wouldn't have got. And actually, that could be um, really positive. So we did recognize that quite early on. Um, but I also had the 
okay, but that is going to give us a cash issue. So we have to solve the cash issue. So how are we going to solve the cash issue? And so we kind of had a day or so of coming to terms with it ourselves and then started phoning our kind of lead investors and getting a bit of advice to say what options have we got to solve kind of temporary cash issue in order to make sure we could get through to this point, which would give us the uh, the kind of decent um, decent upside. Um, and then once we decided on on a kind of path on that, then they, were, they felt like there was a way forward and say the response was very um, positive when we spoke to the investors. The response from the team was very positive. We had to do a few internal things like say, okay, we need to minimise overtime. We're not going to be able to spend we're going to have to conserve cash for the next three months, but it should only be three months and then we'll have a clearer idea of the way forward. And so do you think that was an example of where your sort of prompt decisiveness helped? Yeah, I mean, uh, possibly, but I, ultimately we, we had no choice but to be decisive. Mm -hmm. But I think it was the, I think the key thing was just going, okay, there's no point in panicking here. It is what it is it might have upsides. So let's just look at the situation, look at what we need, look at some options and come up with a way forward. It's quite difficult though for a lot of people to sort of disentangle their emo emotional response to a situation, you know, like the letter, the legal letter coming through. Um, and that's something I've had to work on for years. Um, what sort of tips or tactics have you used to sort of, again, to defuse the sort of, the chimp response, as it were, you know, when they, when things go wrong or something crops up like that letter. Break the problem down into small bits. What are we going to deal with today? So what do we have to do straight away? Because I, I, I think the prompt decision-making is, is interesting, but sometimes you don't have to rush to do absolutely everything in the next few hours. So, I mean, our, our only decision on the day, I think, was, well, let's not send the pitch deck out. <laughs> and, then, um, and then let's... Let's have 24 hours to reflect, to, to get over the, oh, okay, head spinning on all the things. And then let's write down what we need to do. Um, and there's a few other things as well. So we, we also, and uh, well, I do think it made sense to spend um, what felt like a frightening amount of money at the time was to employ somebody, a, an expert from a kind of QC perspective and, and a senior lawyer who could really help with that and and ultimately for this because of the level it was at we needed some really good advice of absolute experts um and so we looked at okay well what do we need on that and therefore what's that part of that going to need from a cash perspective and what do we need to run the business for the next five six months Let's see how we can make all those things happen. And then we've got a plan in place. And then actually once we've done those things, it was pretty much business as usual because it was a three-month gap before the actual court case. Mm. Um, you can't spend some time worrying about it. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great – you've got a, a mind that is it's interesting. It segments these problems into chunks and, and, and sort of checks them off. And I think that's something really uh, useful in that. Because when things happen, you do have this sort of burst of what's going to happen next? What does it? What do we have to do? And then just sort of sort through that and organise that. It's really good advice. And how did it feel once you got that um, the, the case won? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. Uh, did, did it feel? No, it definitely felt like it, it felt like a victory for us because it was effectively a um, start to say that we there was no legal problem with what we were doing and the judiciary were effectively backing it um so it was a combination of relief and then uh okay well what does this mean going forwards and how can we uh we use that and we kind of put the plans back in place um got the pitch deck updated and ready to send out um amusingly sent it uh first week in march 2020 <laughs> 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 two weeks later it's like oh god okay we'll put that on hold again. <laughs> brilliant uh so yes yeah, so that was that that was actually almost felt a bit um a bit worse but there was so much else going on <laughs> in terms of restructuring the business so that everything could be done electronically and everyone was working from home that uh, yeah that kind of took priority for a while 
Wow. So you've had some real, uh, between financial crashes in 2008, high court letters and um, uh, and the like, and global pandemics, you've had some kind of quite a lot of these sort of big external events plonking on your desk to kind of force you to sort of adapt. And I'm, I'm kind of... Um, so, so looking back at all that, I mean, just, just as we're sort of chatting, like, what do you think you sort of, is there a sort of looking at those external things that have impacted you? What was the sort of number one lesson you learned from all those different experiences? Uh, ultimately, we can't control what goes on in the world. And job as, as an entrepreneur, like, I think it's a leader of any business, big or small, is make that making decisions on how to respond to events that might or might not be out of your control it is a is a very real key part of the job um and in times of crisis people will look to leaders to make those decisions and make them feel that there is kind of a plan and there is a way forward and uh, ultimately, that, that is part of the job. It is a really big part of the job to be able to respond and say, this has happened and this is what we're going to do and to communicate as effectively as possible um, with people about it. And um, I, one of the things I started um, this time last year or probably March last year, uh, having gone from a company that everyone was pretty much in the office and actually, ironically, we were just outgrowing the office and we were trying to decide where, whether we moved to a bigger space and how we did it. I'm very glad we didn't <laughs> at the time. Um, we've gone from that to one company that is effectively remote first and occasional office days when people want them. Um, but that's obviously totally changed our communication. So kind of put in place, I do a Friday update to the team. I've just a quick snapshot of what's happened in the week. And I've done it basically every week for the last year or so, year and a bit. Um, but actually that is part of keeping in touch and making sure that we keep in touch and do things in a different way becomes really key. Mm. What, what size is your team currently? Oh, about are we twenty eight? Okay, great. Well, so it's a it's a, it's a it's a focus team, but that communication, particularly remotely, becomes this is I face this. We have a small company. This is fifteen of us, so we're smaller. But that idea, everyone working remotely, trying to keep that culture going, the communication becomes even more important. We found in in, in kind of what other sort of tactics have you learned for to help working remotely with a, a team of twenty eight people? Uh, we've done a few things. I mean, it's interesting. A lot of our team, um, because of the nature of what we do, so we're helping people through divorce. We've got quite a few um, uh, people who kind of have been lawyers in the past or been mediators, wanted a bit more of a flexible job. We employ, we offer very flexible contracts and kind of working patterns and hours, etc. So we have a lot of our team who have kids or have kind of different family commitments and aren't working um, full time. So actually, we realized quite early on doing too much of extra Zoom stuff or get together for this, get together for that actually wasn't really working. <laughs> so, but we have tried to kind of keep that um, regular um, smaller group meetings going. We're now starting to try and get small groups to come back together in the office to have some FaceTime. Uh, we've done dropping birthday lunches. We did do a bit of yoga and PT kind of right at the start of the pandemic when no one was going anywhere. Uh, but it has evolved over time as kind of Zoom fatigue set in and, and it's been very much based on what people are saying they want in terms of level of contact or not. Okay, so you're sort of evolving to fit what's appropriate and what people are want and don't want. Uh, it's interesting. I think this, this you talked a number of times about the, the, the your the entrepreneur's role as a leader, and I think what you're talking about there is is leadership in the sense of sensing what is and isn't appropriate given the new circumstances and people's home lives. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to touch on actually is that the role of purpose, which I guess is a part of leadership or part of the positioning or proposition or the mission of the, of the business. You've got a business now, and I'm, I'm going to um, quote you back to yourself, 
but you've said um, that successful startups will, in the future, will combine a sustainable business model with a clear social purpose and diverse teams. And I think the bit around purpose, I only want to focus zero in on, if I can. But could you explain why a clear purpose is so important for a, a business or an entrepreneur? I think society is, is really starting to shift now. And the next generations coming through are not accepting that things can just be purely financially driven. Um, and we see that in um, where people want to work, how they want to work, what is important to them. And I feel things like the pandemic have really shifted that. Um, and actually, they are the businesses that will come to the fore and have much more in terms of staying power are the businesses where they have that double, that double focus. So purpose by itself, not necessarily sure that works either. And that effectively you're then looking at a charity, but that combination of um, we are doing something that is certainly not going to damage society and ideally is going to improve society. Plus um, we think there's a business opportunity to do it. I think mm -hmm. it's a hugely powerful um powerful kind of combination and you can see that across the whole investment landscape now with people looking at um uh esg funds and looking at kind of really focusing on where cash is going and it's a movement that's started relatively recently but seems to be growing in pace every year and that's forcing all companies to make decisions on what they do, what their environmental impact is, what their societal impact is. And once big companies realise they have to be doing that as well, it's a complete shift. What I think is interesting about, about Amicable is it's so baked into the proposition. Yeah. You know, the kind of social purpose. In, and uh, again, you've, you've talked about how you focus on the family rather than the individuals and the impact on the children and what have you. And I think that's sort of... Uh, do you think that how do you think that impacts you as the entrepreneur and also perhaps your team as being part of that that proposition? Um, I, it's really key to our team. A lot of people have have joined us because they like that that's part of it as well, and they genuinely feel that they're helping people at a difficult time, um, and that's really key to them. And it, we're, I mean, our trust pilot. Um, Ratings are something we're really proud of. Um, we know we are uh, way above anything else kind of in, in the category and just reading the kind of quotes on there, it, it, it's lovely because it really reaffirms what we're doing, that people say that this is genuinely, you've helped us through a really difficult time in a way that's way better than it, it might have been. And divorce is, is never easy. We don't try and pretend it's easy, but we do think it can be navigated in a way to lessen the impact. And that can have a really big impact, not just on the couple, but also on their kids, on their family and friends. And I don't know if you've had friends who've gone through a very difficult divorce. It's not a nice thing <laughs> for anybody who's connected in any way. Um, it, employers, uh, all kinds of people can be really affected. And so any couple we make it better for or we help them get through in a better way, that has a knock-on impact. Yeah, it's interesting. The, the ripple effect, I think, is a really good point there, is the ripple effect of these negative energies going out into the world and, and, and your ability to sort of help that. I, I can see how that would be a very motivating force for you as, a, as an individual. I mean, the cost to society, the figures um, are quite terrifying. So in the UK, it's $51 billion a year. Of taxpayers' money gets paid on, gets spent on other people's family breakdown. Fifty-one billion, really. Fifty-one billion. That's actually bigger than the defence budget. It's about one thousand eight hundred pounds per taxpayer. Wow. Court time, that social services involvement, that um, cost in kind of terms of people having time off work and sick and all those things. It's it's a huge cost. Um, and so there really is a, kind of a, a big, there should be a really big push from society that this is something that uh, that is changed and is navigated in a, in a better way. Mm. I think it's, it's a very, yeah, I agree uh, for what it's worth. Having observed other people's divorces, 
um, yeah, it's a whole bunch of negative sort of uh, stuff that, that if you can kind of navigate that more um, amicably, to, co- to coin a phrase, then that will okay. be... Do you like what I did there? <laughs> I baked it in. I'm on message <laughs> to, to, to really help everybody. And, and, and yeah, and I think this is, there's a really interesting point in there. The bit I'm perhaps resonating with is I think personally, I find when things get tough or difficult, if my business has a purpose to it that's greater than remunerating Dan Kirby, then it helps me um, carry that weight or that stress or that difficulty and to serve the customer and the team so that you're actually, you know, you're doing something bigger than yourself. Yeah. And I think that's, I'm, I'm resonating with that with what, what you're doing, which I think is really admirable. So, you know, well done you. And I think that's kind of, um, I, I wish you all the best success. We're actually kind of coming up towards the end of our, our podcast together and it's been really fascinating and I've, got, I've really learned a lot, a load of stuff here around plans versus reality and, disrupting the status quo and prompt decisions versus rushed decisions and really interesting themes within our conversation. Before we finish, I like to ask people at the end of, a, of this conversation, these conversations about what advice they would ask people to ignore. However, I'm going to tweak my question to you. <laughs> I, I've, I too have three children. I have three daughters and you, uh, and my eldest is 17 now, and which is um, in the realm of the girls' network sort of age range and I'm, so i picked up on your your trusteeship of the girls network and about your, uh, advice you should for young women looking at their careers and, and my daughter is is looking at her careers literally at the moment and what university and what, what about this what about that what advice should my 17 year old daughter ignore while looking at her future career um okay so firstly sorry dad so i i um, so the Girls Network is a fantastic charity that, that, that provides female mentors for girls from disadvantaged backgrounds. I have now finished as a trustee there. I was a trustee for six years, and my time okay, yeah. end, but I'm still very much an active supporter of uh, of them, and I love what they're doing. Um, what should your daughter ignore? Um, the Education is everything, and you might not want to hear that as a parent, <laughs> and especially now when I think the nature of the university has changed. I went to university. I loved it. I never regret going. But if my children decided they wanted to take a different path or go at a different age or do things in a different way, I think the world has changed, and that's fine. And and if they are being proactive and making their own paths, then that that would, I think, be up to – I don't think they're writing anything off by doing things in a different way. Um, so ultimately the advice to ignore is you've got to follow a traditional path. You haven't. There are so much, so many more ways to succeed or do things differently than I think there were 30 years ago, let alone kind of 50, 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. So it, be perfectly prepared to kind of follow your own path and, and go after stuff because you can always change your mind and, do other things later or go and get a sensible corporate job later or <laughs> go and do X, Y, and Z. That's, that's, that's really great, actually. I, I'll, um, I will be, I'm just trying to recruit another listener to my podcast, my daughter. So I'll get her to listen to that. So I'm up in the, <laughs> the stats already, uh, but that's great advice. I think for anyone there, follow your own path. I think whether you're a 17 year old young woman looking at your future career or a, like me, 47 year old, grumbly old man looking at the future following your own paths is great advice so i i, yeah, that is, I mean think the, the realms of being entrepreneurial can be at any age now and that's yeah. really challenged it doesn't have to be somebody who's come straight out of a computer science degree at um x university and is in their 20s and living in london you can live anywhere you can be any age you can definitely be any gender and actually the there is no real blockers on entrepreneurs apart from you having an idea and the real desire to do it. Well, that's a fantastic call to arms for us all. And, and I'm going to take it as that. And thank you so much for being so open, Pip. It's been a really honor to, to chat to you and, and, and sort of pick your brains and get all this good information. There's loads of good stuff in here. Um, where should we send people to, to find out more about Amicable or to find out more about you? Absolutely. So amicable.io. 
Okay, so amicable.io, find out all about that uh, great product, um, a, a really exciting, and I think we, we genuinely wish you all the best with it. Um, what about social media? You on, you on any, any, where's the best Twitter? Twitter. I'm on Twitter as uh, Pickleson Zero and on LinkedIn. Perfect. Well, I, I shall put all these links in the show notes. Uh, so, so on Twitter at Pip Wilson Zero, and and thank you again. Uh, really great to, to meet you, and really great to, to hear your story. So, uh, uh, thanks ever so much, and I'll uh, see you next time, everybody. If you want to receive the top five tidbits, the nuggets, the insights from each episode in your inbox every week. Head up to honeyibluupthebusiness.com. Yes, the snappily titled honeyibluupthebusiness.com and enter your email address and uh, we're going to get the best bits. We're going to collate them together and we're going to send them to you. So you don't have to write them down when listening to the podcast. Yes, nice and easy. So get up there, enter your email address, get the tips, all good. And I've got to say before I go that this podcast is generously supported by my company, The Tech Department. Thank you, guys. They are indulging me as I'm pursuing this little creative project. If you want to find a company that helps make your technology better so that gets your business better as well, head up to thetechdept.com. So on behalf of everybody here, thanks for listening. See you next time.